Hi friends, welcome again to another episode of Beyond the Clouds Edge to Edge Transformation. And as always, I want to learn about what's happening in every part of the world, how much the changes that are going on technologically are affecting people and how they are responding, how they are creating change. And one of the drivers of this transformation in India is Professor V. Ram Gopal Rao. I really got to know him from LinkedIn and from many of our common acquaintances. And it's a privilege for me to hear about uh, Professor Rao's journey. Please tell us a little bit about yourself uh, so that we all get to know a little bit about your journey, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Shankar Hemadiji. Thanks for talking to me. I started my career uh, from a remote uh, village in Telangana. Uh, that's uh, known as Kullapur. And I actually studied until my 12th standard, uh, full 17 years in that town, in that small little town and uh, in Telugu medium. I had no exposure to English uh, until I uh, finished my 12th, my entire schooling. Uh, so, so from that Telugu medium, the only option available for me at that time was uh, the local entrance exam for engineering. And that's what I took. And then I did my B.Tech uh, from Kakatiya University. And after that, I joined IIT Bombay for my microelectronics uh, master's. And uh, so that is how, in fact, that is where my career began. And I came in contact with some of the best people, like you know, some of the names you mentioned. You worked with Professor Chandrakar. I worked, <laughs> he also taught me. I worked with Professor Vasi, so he was my teacher too. And uh, I, after my master's, then I continued with him for a PhD because I was so impressed uh, with Professor Vasi that I wanted to stay with him. But then I uh, got an offer from uh, Munich in Germany, uh, from from university there. In about two years' time, I got my doctor engineer degree. And after my um, uh, PhD, then I moved to UCLA uh, for my postdoctoral research. I spent a couple of years there. At that time, I worked with Professor Vishwanathan. Uh, professor Vishwanathan is a, was a very well-known professor. He passed away recently uh, at a very old age. But, uh, but he was a great man. I worked with him. And I also worked with Professor Jason Wu in, uh, in UCLA. So after a couple of years, I got an offer from... IIT Bombay to join as a faculty member. So I am talking of uh, 1998, exactly this month, uh, you know, 25 years ago, I joined uh, IIT Bombay as a as a faculty member, as an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering. So I became a colleague of Professor Vasi, Professor Chandurkar and others. And I continued uh, in IIT Bombay for, uh, for full... Uh, 18 years uh, as a faculty member and in 2016 I, I left IIT Bombay to join IIT Delhi as the director and there I spent six years as a director and uh, then I continued for one more year as a, as a faculty member and uh, after that uh, Kumar Mangalam Birla, he was our chairman board of governors at IIT Delhi when I was the director I, I was reporting to the board and he was the chairman. And uh, so he persuaded me to join Bits Pilani system. So I joined Bits Pilani in March this year, 2023. I am looking after uh, the Bits Pilani campuses. We have five campuses now. And uh, so I, I am particularly interested in the higher education system, you know, the policy changes, what are the sort of things that we need to change in India. I, I write regularly for Times of India. And I, I write, uh, you know, for the Sunday Times. I also closely follow what is happening world over in the higher education space, the the learnings that we can have from all these systems. And I think it, it has been a very interesting journey so far. You know, Professor, one of the things that made me uh, call you, write to you and say, could we talk, is your heart-to-heart connection. Um, I've seen so many students of IIT Delhi and even faculty members say, oh my God, he's moved on. And there's this deep connection you have at a personal level, at a professional level. Um, can you talk about that? That's not very common in engineering. How did you become who you are today? 
I think it must uh, have be because of my upbringing. I, you know, uh, I, I was in a very rural kind of a setting where uh, the personal connections were all that mattered. We practically knew everybody in my town. And uh, so that uh, uh, probably, you know, was quite deep rooted that way that I am, I am happy when I am with people, when I am, you know, in the company of uh, people I trust. And I am a very, you know, trusting kind of a person. I, uh, I, I think that that has been the way it, uh, it has been. So, so I think uh, probably it is my upbringing. Seventeen years in a in a small town kind of a setting, uh, you know, I think that that must be the reason. And I am very very connected to the roots. Uh, I still go to my place. I visit the schools where I have come from. I support them in all possible ways. I connect with children there. So, so that, that's my passion, in fact. So, I mean, uh, I do realize that all of us are born differently. You know, we all have uh, our own personal advantages, disadvantages to start with. And life, you know, doesn't treat everybody fairly. And there are so many people who are very talented in these rural areas, you know, who need that guidance. Uh, you know, somebody to handhold. So I, I, just, I want to be that person always for anyone who comes in contact with me because all these positions and, you know, whatever we have achieved, I, you know, it's nothing really is individual kind of a thing. You know, we have all been helped by somebody at some point in time. And there are so many things that happen in life, you know, which are not even in our control, right? And uh, I think taking personal credit for all of that, Whatever we have become, I, I think is unfair for anyone. I mean, there are the circumstances, the, the kind of a, uh, platforms that have been provided to us, the, the number of people who have helped us in our careers. I think if we just think back, you know, all of that, and if we start connecting the dots, you, know, you can only connect the dots by looking backward, not by looking forward. So when you look backward and connect all the dots, you realize that, you know, there are so many people who have played a role. I think that makes you humble, grateful. And uh, I think the more you think about it, the the more grateful you become. And that's also probably a way to be happy. You know, so the, and if I, if somebody starts taking that view that it's me, I, me, myself, you know, I have made my career, all that, uh, then you, you become arrogant and, I think that cuts you off from people and I, I don't want to be that person. And I think that, that gratitude, gratefulness, I believe are very, very important uh, in life. And everybody must uh, realize that you know so many people helped us along the way and we also need to do the same for so many others. I think that's how it has to be. You know, uh, Professor Rao, what you're saying rings true totally for me. Professor, she mentioned Professor Sandarkar and Professor Vasi. Uh, Professor Isaac, J.R. Isaac, they were my mentors on campus. And uh, truly, uh, if it wasn't for if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have continued. I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful for the work you're doing to be there for people. I've seen that you have a keen interest in seeing India develop in technology, even in rural areas, and your contributions seem to be many. Could you get into that? Could you tell us a little bit about how much you have seen change and how have you been able to support some of these changes at the academic institutions and other places? You know, I I got exposed to research and in the micro nano electronics areas uh, in my master's at IIT Bombay, and I did my master's thesis with Professor Vasi. I worked on rad radiation heart technologies uh, for uh, Indian space uh, applications, and uh, so that technology got transferred to a foundry here, Semiconductor Complex Limited and all that. So I got exposed to the technologies which can impact uh, you know, society. Uh, in this particular case, space technologies. Way back uh, you know, when I was doing my master's in 89 to 91. And then after my uh, master's PhD and all of that, I came back and joined India, uh, joined IIT Bombay. And uh, But my the problems I started working was still the problems that you know, I had I was working in the US. I, I brought back those samples and I worked with Intel very closely for a very long time. 
uh, as part of various projects. Uh, so I wrote lots of papers with Intel researchers. And uh, so that continued even after I joined IIT Bombay. But around 2005, 2006 kind of a time frame, I took a very conscious decision that, you know, if I want to work for Intel, you know, I could have stayed back in the stayed back in the US and I need not have come back to India. You know, after all, it did not connect uh, very well in you know, all those dots. And I thought, you know, while I would like to be connected with uh, all these big multinationals work for these industries, I thought, you know, I should also be doing something which can impact the society around me. So that is when I started to consciously look for problems in the society in India and see if I can, you know, develop solutions for some of these problems. Because I've always taken this view that engineering is all about solving the problems. You know, engineering is not about electrical, mechanical. These are all disciplines that we have artificially created for administrative reasons. But, but engineering is all about solving problems. And that is the kind of a way I look at engineering. And uh, so, so I uh, took this uh, decision of working on societal problems. So I then, but with the moment I wanted to do that, I realized that, uh, you know, it highly becomes multidisciplinary. I cannot alone solve these problems with my double E background. Then I, I started building these multidisciplinary groups at IIT Bombay. In fact, the first ever large multidisciplinary project ever undertaken uh, at IIT Bombay was, you know, in our group with me as the PI and then with some of my colleagues where I participated as a, as a as an investigator. So that kind of a culture we started at IIT Bombay. We took a project, the very first project we took was a cardiac diagnostic kind of a system. So we wanted to be known as solution providers to, you know, predicting heart attacks and, and early screening of uh, heart problems and that sort of a project. And I'm being an electrical engineer that required a lot of cooperation from other colleagues and which is what we were able to successfully do. We developed the technology, then we started uh, a company, NanoSniff, and we transferred this technology to NanoSniff. And after we transferred the technology to NanoSniff, we started working on an explosive detection uh, because uh, we wanted to uh, you know, develop a very low cost technology to protect airports and uh, you know the malls and every other place because security started becoming a big threat for india uh, everywhere you go you know there was a fear of bomb blast and all of that so when uh, that became an issue then we started working on the explosive detection that is one technology which we could successfully develop uh, commercialize again we transferred the technology to the same company nanosniff and uh, nanosniff uh, in this particular case because it was did not require you know all those hospitals and medical doctors and all that was able to successfully develop the technology we transferred it to them at a proof of concept stage they took it forward and make it into a complete product released that product now multiple airports in india are actually using that technology and uh, so that has been a very successful uh, sort of a technology development uh, project, which took full 10 years, but it is the world's first micro sensor based technology. All other technologies you see are, uh, you know, spectroscopy and those sort of things, which are very expensive. Ours was a MEMS, a micro electromechanical system based technology, which is very low cost and, and which is, which is uh, as good as anything that you can do with any other platform. And it's a totally disruptive technology in the market. So we now, you know, win all the tenders and any bid, you know, where we compete with the best, but at a much lower price. And uh, we have no competition in the world now. So that is that has been a game changer in the explosive detection space. I'm sure it will pick up, uh, you know, momentum and the world over it will become uh, popular and known. And uh, so after that, I moved into the agricultural sensors. And there again, uh, I started my second company uh, that was uh, SoilSense. And SoilSense has also been able to successfully commercialize an NPK sensor, a nitrate, phosphate, potassium. Um, and then we are also working on other nutrients for the soil. It's like a glucometer for the soil. And that technology is also out in the market and selling well. So these two companies that I started, NanoSniff and uh, uh, SoilSense, uh, you know, I was instrumental in starting them. Uh, but of course, there are co-founders. There are so many people who have contributed to that. 
and more importantly the students who worked on those projects uh, with me as a phd students they moved to the companies as ceo and then they built a team and you know all the credit goes to them for the successful commercialization of these technologies and uh, my other area of research the cmos the nano electronics the the ones which drive all the um, you know commercial um, ics and everything that there i work with all these big companies intel and others and that technology has also we filed uh, at least a dozen patents with intel and uh, in fact intel has given me uh, officially in writing that the ip that we transfer to intel is used in hundreds of millions of uh, chips now that they sell worldwide we worked on a system on chip integration high voltage functionality on the core cmos and uh, that technology the de mos you know some of those platforms we developed and optimized for intel are now there in hundreds of millions of chips world sold worldwide so that was also very satisfying and a very productive collaboration with intel so i think on both the fronts whether it is you know impacting uh, the the semiconductor uh, you know the the systems or uh, semiconductor markets through intel uh, collaboration are developing technologies for the societal need in india i think it has been pretty satisfying and uh, um, so i am now continuing most of my research currently is uh, into the sensors the micro sensor domain but for different applications i am one of the projects which i am confident you know i will be able to commercialize is uh, uh, which i am currently working on is the the radiation therapy the cancer uh, the radiation there are no easy way to actually detect the amount of radiation the the patient sees now they they do lot of simulations uh, they do you know they use certain technologies but uh, what we are developing can accurately measure the profile of radiation that the body sees and uh, so that uh, you can we can pinpoint your radiation and and with accurate measurement you know you can uh, have a much be- much better radiation therapy so that is a, a platform we are developing based on organic materials and all that which are all flexible sensors and there i hold a us patent uh, right now and that's the one which we are trying to develop as a product and commercialize that for the for the medical radiation application so so i think that is how it has been on one hand working with big large companies uh, for uh, you know in those sectors where you know, academia cannot really compete with them so it's better to join hands with them in the other space the micro sensors the nano sensors kind of a domain which are more uh, you know like applications for societal problems so this is how i concentrate on my research uh, the two dimensions i have for the research most of my phd students work on one of these two kinds of problems i remember you were also instrumental in starting at iit delhi a whole incubator uh, encouraging uh, students at all levels to participate in the process of uh, creating incubating new technologies commercializing that's that's very exciting could you tell us a little bit about that uh, i uh, had an opportunity to serve as the director of iit delhi for 6 years so one of my you know always thinking is our institutions have become very homogeneous you know when it comes to their functioning the multidisciplinarity is is very rare to find in indian institutions we have a very fragmented higher education system you know for example for medicine we have separate schools for engineering we have separate schools for agriculture separate for pharmacy separate for sciences separate for management separate i think that's not helping us you know whereas problems don't come with a disciplinary tag problems are problems and uh, because we have siloed the higher education system into so many uh, sort of uh, disciplines you know the often the collaborations become difficult and uh, as a result taking any research all the way up to a product stage you know becomes pretty challenging in our higher educational institutions i as a individual researcher was successful because i was able to connect with all these people form those groups and you know do things uh, successfully in at least some of these cases but i thought can we uh, replicate that model what i was able to do as an individual at the institutional level so that was uh, one of my ambition so that was you know what drove me to uh, to take up the position uh, in iit delhi uh, as a director 
and uh, i had you know some of those thoughts which i thought i should implement at a larger scale and uh, you know lead these institutions in their direction so at iit delhi you know the first thing i did was i started a program called faculty interdisciplinary research project scheme firp as we called it we said if two faculty members from two different departments or a domain knowledge come together and work on a problem which is well defined then institute would provide them some seed grant so that was a scheme that we launched just to encourage collaborations across the domains across the discipline so that you know i always took this view that if you solve the problem of bringing people together i think they will solve all the other problems so the first thing as an administrator i was keen on doing was to incentivize people to work with each other make them come out of their comfort zones you know interact with each other so so that scheme helped uh, you know very significantly many people we funded at least 50 projects you know involving more than two or three departments and you know hundreds of faculty members started to form groups and work together in 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 uh, at the intersection of different disciplines and then we extended this scheme to institutions outside i went and met with the director all india institute of medical sciences i went and met with the uh, you know the chairman of drdo went and met with the director general you know the indian council for agricultural research uh, with many people many institutions in delhi i went and met with them and then we had a similar agreement we fund our faculty they fund their faculty so that you know engineering medicine will come together engineering and agriculture sectors will come together so we brought all these institutions together and then we in fact that was an initiative that we took which eventually led to you know government of india starting a scheme for for cluster projects in in cities the delhi cluster uh, got formed uh, out of some of those efforts and then the delhi cluster got funded by the principal scientific advisors office so one led to the other but i was very keen on you know the making people from diverse disciplines come together and that has been very successful and uh, and when once we uh, you know I, i i always talk about these unlike minds you know i felt that uh, you know we need to bring these unlike minds together to me unlike was in terms of disciplinary knowledge the unlike you know in terms of different disciplines coming together unlike in terms of people with different attitudes coming together that is where academia industry collaborations i pushed very aggressively at uh, iit delhi we started an industry day during my time we we created a position of dean corporate relations and uh, so we we started to connect with industries very aggressively so because that is what an unlike minds in terms of you know different attitudes uh, sort of a thing and i also said you know unlike minds in terms of different cultures so the so during my time the international programs at iit delhi we significantly enhanced them you know we wrote a proposal to government of india for iits to collaborate with asean countries so we started that asean phd program and uh, so that uh, in fact uh, i was there along when it was launched along with the minister of education minister for external affairs on the same platform where we announced that all iits will start working with student from asian countries the and then uh, i we started uh, a 500 phd fellowship program for international students we said you know anyone who want from outside the country wants to do phd at iit delhi you know we would provide all the support and the stipends and all of that so 500 phd fellowships we announced for international students so that was again because of this unlike kind of a concept and my worry was our institutions being very homogeneous you know no innovation will come out so so that so bringing these industries together bringing different disciplines together bringing different cultures together i think institutions need to become that melting pots you know where new ideas will come about and that is exactly what happened iit delhi filed uh, as many patents in my time as the director as the previous 55 years now previous 55 years wow. iit had filed about 500 patents during my 5 years we actually filed more than 500 patents i think that was a kind of a quantum jump we saw in uh, generation of new ideas and the new ways of doing things and uh, we also raised lot of money during my time we approached alumni we started the endowment fund and because you know to support all of these initiatives you need resources 
as a director i thought my role is you know basically to recruit the best people bring them together and make them work together as a group and provide resources to them so these were the things that i was focusing on uh, i also recruited every third faculty member at iit delhi you know today is somebody who was recruited during my time as the as the director i think you know some of these uh, definitely made a made an impact to the institute you know institute started to move forward even in terms of rankings and every other way we saw a progression towards uh, the better rankings and better systems and more money and that sort of a thing so the things really took off at iit delhi and uh, we also started to support all this growth you know we couldn't have accommodated all this growth within the existing you know disciplinary kind of boundaries and uh, the same department same centers so we opened new academic units during my time at least 10 new academic units came into existence either through uh, you know change of their uh, uh, their uh, the composition you know some schools were Uh, some centers were not functioning well so we closed them down and in their place we started newer centers you know keeping keeping up with the modern uh, changes that are currently taking place and a uh, so lot of multidisciplinary kind of centers we created a school for interdisciplinary research and we created a department of design because i again felt that iits are too focused on too narrowly focused on engineering to make an impact in the society you need to be a little bit broad based so we started a department of design so that you know engineers and designers can work together to develop products um, and uh, so for example uh, you know the 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 design is uh, becoming very critical now uh, in all of uh, what we do uh, so aesthetics are very important and iit is not getting to that area you know with so many startups happening now i thought that was very important so we started a department of design at iit delhi and also a school of public policy because policy and technology need to go hand in hand and uh, that is where we started a new school of public policy so so many such new entities uh, you know have have all been driving the growth we also started a center for electric vehicles a cart we called it and that's again doing very well at iit delhi right now i think many of these initiatives made a you know see change to the way the institute functions and uh, i hope some of these schools over a period of time will make a will will make a mark in the in the education space and you know i am confident things are things will go in that direction i heard about this from my friends and colleagues all over silicon valley not just from people from india but also many american entrepreneurs as well as uh, venture capitalists so it is of the work you started is clearly getting noticed around the world and i truly appreciate that you didn't just stop at the boundaries within the engineering faculty or even within india to bring together our neighboring countries in uh, asia what was your inspiration for bringing all this together i think my inspiration was also the american education system you know that is where american schools uh, do things very differently even if you go to any you know even second tier third tier american universities you you have people coming from all over the world interacting with each other and the kind of connect they also have with uh, industries for example at ucla i saw that all the problems that we were working on were things which were generated you know through industry collaboration somebody would come to you and say that you know we are doing this processing we are making these devices and these devices are failing there are some yield problems we don't understand what is happening can you help us understand so that is how most of the problems uh, started there and that was the kind of a strong connect that these institutions have established with the society you know or with these industries you know have have really helped these institutions and and you know people coming from all over the world working with each other learning from each other i think you know that is something which is missing in the indian academic system we have become so much inward looking you know for example in in iits even to support a phd student who is who is not a, not an indian is such a big challenge because you know, the question is a, a public money how can you spend providing scholarships to you know international students these things were not even allowed so we were able to do that because during my time we successfully pitched for this institution of feminine scheme and iit delhi was one of the first three institutions in the country to be selected 
for the institution of eminence during my time. So that gave us some additional funds and those funds we, because it was there as part of the project proposal, we were able to spend it in creating uh, those international student programs. And in fact, I was also the first uh, uh, person from the IIT system to write a letter to ministry asking for permission for IIT Delhi to open a campus in, in, in Middle East. In fact, I made the groundwork when we were doing the Tashian program. I also connected with a lot of ambassadors from Middle East, you know, with a with a uh, kind of an idea to create a start an IIT Delhi extension campus in the Middle East, so that you know we can admit students there, recruit world class faculty there, you know, connect them with the parent campus in India, bring these students who are admitted there to come and stay for a year on the Indian campus. So that, you know, they mix with the Indian students in the Indian campuses. That is also a good learning for them, you know, coming from uh, various parts of the world and joining this um, campus in the Middle East. And that eventually took some time and all that. But but finally, you know, it reached the PMO and then uh, they woke up to the fact that, you know, this is something IITs should do. And, and now you see all that push happening for IITs opening campuses outside. I, I personally feel, you know, Indian institutions have a lot to learn from the from the American universities. There are, of course, challenges in the American system. You know, the financial models, what India has, Indian institutions have, what American institutions have are, are very diverse. You know, the that burden on the students in the American system, you know, in terms of student loans and all that is something that can, that is not necessary. In fact, Australia follows a much better model, you know, when it comes to student uh, financing than, than US or India. Indian institutions don't even have a financial model. Because we don't have a financial model, we are solely dependent on government of India for the funding, and that is hurting these institutions very badly. American universities have become too much privatized, you know, so that now, of course, the endowment funds and other things are there in the American system. But the student burden, you know, in terms of loans is still pretty high in America. Australia has a program called HELP, Higher Education Loan Program, which is working very well. So there is something to learn from these best practices followed in some of these countries uh, and then use a model for India, you know, which suits the Indian condition. And uh, I think things need to change significantly in India for us to regain that leadership in, in sciences, in engineering, in technology, so that, you know, India can, can start to aspire for Nobel Prizes and other things. Now that you are with a private institution, uh, the Birla Institute of Technology and Science, which already has a campus, I believe, in Dubai and uh, multiple campuses. Do you see that the private education system in India could be able to do that, to be able to bring about these kinds of international collaborations and bring about uh, technical as well as, uh, you know, industrial prosperity? That's a good point. Uh, while the government institutions are struggling because of the lack of autonomy, financial model and all that. In the private sector, at least in bits, I see there is a financial model. But that financial model to me is a little bit skewed, you know, in the sense that 70 percent of revenues in bits, you know, basically come from uh, the tuition fee. And uh, the rest 30 percent again is a tuition fee, but collected from the from the working professionals in the industry and all of that. I don't consider that as a good financial model. I think that is where, in fact, I have already spoken with Kumar Mangalam Birla, who is our uh, chancellor. You know, who is who is a stalwart. I mean, if you look at the uh, the industry space in India, I mean, the sixty five billion dollar empire, the Aditya Birla Group, he single handedly you know built that and took that group to such great heights. A great man, you know. It's a, I'm fortunate to be interacting with him and reporting to him and discussing with him on all of these points. So we have converged on this uh, concept of diversifying the financial model. We don't want a tuition fee alone to support the institution. So we want it, you know, more like, let's say, you know, what happens in Stanford or, you know, MIT kind of places where you have, let's say, at least one third of your revenues coming from the tuition fee, one third of your revenues coming from the endowment funds the interest on the endowment funds and one third of the money coming from 
the overheads on the on the research projects and other kinds of uh, activities that we do in the institute so i want to reduce the tuition fee burden on the students by raising an endowment fund in fact we are in the process of uh, launching a 100 million dollar endowment fund for bits pilani uh, and uh, we have already been in uh, talks with uh, many of our alumni and many tell me that you know 100 million dollars for bits is not a big deal there are multiple you know billionaires and there are 14 unicorns that have come out of uh, the bits pilani alumni uh, they have been responsible for 14 unicorns including a decacon and there are at least you know 100 people i met with who have had 100 million dollar kind of exits you know out of their companies so i think with such rich network of uh, alumni i don't think bits should be you know charging such a huge fee from the students and and turning away the merit you know that's the last thing we should be doing so we will be launching that endowment fund pretty soon we are we are making the groundwork for that and then that endowment will support the scholarships to all the needy students this will be need based need not be need blind at this stage but at least if somebody you know based on their family income if we decide to you know get that person we should be able to offer uh, the scholarship because the the admissions in bits are entirely merit based there is no other channel to get into bits we conduct that bits sat exam which is as difficult as the je exam and uh, we admit about 1.5 lakh students take that exam we admit about 3500 students so so we want all the top rankers in bits sat to come to iit and not go to other kind of institutions in the country so so the scholarship is one thing that we are doing there the research culture also we are growing in the institute right now and uh, we are uh, establishing multiple centers of excellence we are connecting with uh, the aditya birla group to start with so that they can also support research in these institutions through uh, you know whatever kind of uh, technologies they want to collaborate us with and you know, these are the kinds of changes that i am bringing about so that uh, we diversify the financial model and uh, make merit the sole criterion for students to come to bits you know not their uh, family background or not their you know the fee paying capacity or anything like that so i think this would happen will take couple of years but that's a direction that we will be moving towards and the research culture needs to grow further in bits right now so we are also generating lot of scholarships for uh, for phd students and in fact i am very excited that in the next uh, one two days you will see a public announcement of a phd program which is very unique for india that program we are calling it phd startup track and what happens today is uh, all phd programs in india are are essentially tailored to produce university professors so in india the general uh, concept misconception is you know that you do phd if you want to become a professor so we are saying that you know phd is not necessarily to become a professor phd can also be to become an entrepreneur so that is a kind of a change in mindset we are bringing about that we will be admitting students on the projects where the they have reached a certain level of technology readiness levels the and then there we will associate these phd students uh, with the goal that these phd students after working on such high trl projects can can eventually take that project to the market as a startup so we are looking for more phd students who have that aptitude to start companies and who have the aptitude to become entrepreneurs so from the beginning the kind of coursework we provide them the kind of projects we make them work on they will all be the ones where they can start a company eventually so that is something that we are uh, uh, starting now as a new phd track and uh, we have already been able to tie up with multiple uh, vcs and uh, even the internal projects that we have so that uh, we will be able to uh, our goal is to create at least 100 uh, startups through the phd students we admit in this track uh, right away is right now today in the country there are about 300000 phds doing phd in all the higher educational institutions how many phds you see in the entrepreneurship space you can actually you know count on your fingers you know so the things have been so bad because the phd is typically you know graduate and look for a post doctoral position or you know look for a faculty position but nobody is uh, venturing into the entrepreneurship space because of 
know, various other various reasons here. So, so that is one change in culture that we want to bring about through the BIT system. In fact, BITS has always been known for its uh, you know innovations in the educational space. Whether you talk in terms of the dual degree programs, you know, BITS has been doing it for 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 a few decades now. A student uh, who ad who gets admission for the bachelor's program in mechanical engineering can do a master's program, an MSc in chemistry or an MSc in biology. So that sort of a combination is possible today only in BITS. I see so many BITS students, you know, doing uh, BE in uh, a bachelor's of engineering in let's say uh, uh, mechanical engineering and at the same time doing MSc in biology kind of thing. So, so that sort of flexibility exists in the system. And uh, so I think continuing on, on those sort of innovations, this PhD program, in my opinion, you know, can be a game changer, it will set a new trend, you know, for all such programs in the country. The idea is to, you know, get into more deep technology uh, kind of entrepreneurship space. India has enough unicorns. You know, we have like 107, 108 unicorns, but none of them are in the, none of them is in the technology space. They are all, you know, currently business model innovations, more of an aggregator kind of a model, but none which is actually selling a product and making money. So the, the their products are, of course, services. Their products are these apps, you know, a fintech space, those e-commerce. I think that's good. There is nothing wrong in that. But time has come for us now to create, uh, you know, unicorns in the technology space, in the deep technology space. That can happen only through the PhD students or through students who have worked on a technology for a period of time. And uh, that can be either by working in such an industry for a for a long time and then coming out and starting a company or trained to work on a certain technology as part of your PhD training and receive all the necessary help and support, even financially, to you know start your own venture after PhD. In this PhD program, we will also be creating you know seed fund for them to build prototypes and all of that. So, so this is a new program that we are starting in bits. I think let's see how, how things will progress in that direction. Oh, I really commend your efforts. Uh, when I look at the history of Silicon Valley, it was truly... Uh, people like you who uh, at the academic institutions like Stanford changed the culture of education. Uh, Hewlett Packard, much later Intel, uh, more recently Google, and a host of companies came out of young minds and with a very clear focus on taking research in the, you know, making it real. Uh, truly, that's an amazing effort you have and all power to you and all the students. So much change is going on. Do you have any advice on how a student should select or how do they plan their career? A large fraction of students, you know, I would say 90% or above, are stopping their careers with just a graduate, undergraduate degree, BTEC. They don't even want to pursue higher education. And if at all they are pursuing, it's for MBA kind of degrees. Very few at IIT Delhi, less than 5% of our students are going for higher, higher education. When I say higher education, research, PhD and things like that, less than 5% right now which is hurting all the innovation capabilities of these students because with a BTEC degree, you don't understand anything. You have just scratched the surface, you know, when it comes to technologies and all of that. With that, the only areas where you can innovate are in IT, e-commerce, fintech, and those sort of spaces. Whereas there are huge opportunities waiting to be explored, you know, in the biotechnology area, in the nanotechnology area, in the quantum technology area, in the AI, ML kind of areas that you cannot do with a with a with a simple bachelor's kind of a degree and uh, and that is what is hurting innovation in all those other sectors so as a result the only jobs we seem to be generating are the it jobs there are no other jobs we are generating because there are there is not much innovation happening in any of these other areas because our top talent isn't even pursuing you know anything beyond uh, the the btec kind of degrees and and because jobs are available in the it area everybody you know, is just taking up those IT jobs. And, and because jobs are available there, everybody wants to take up uh, disciplines where they can eventually work in IT. I think we have gotten into this vicious circle. And a few of these students, you know, coming out of that vicious circle, moving ahead, 
and you know getting into these deep technology kind of spaces and then creating innovation there and creating companies there doing interesting th things in those domains i think you know we'll open up opportunities in those sectors too and that is when once there are jobs available in those sectors i think more and more students would would uh, you know go towards those areas and that is how innovation can happen in some of these domains too well professor it's been a joy talking to you and listening to you and learning from you and uh, to people out here i'm always looking to hear from you to learn about what's happening not just in the us but around the world we are in a time of transition so much is changing all around us not just in uh, high tech as in it or in uh, data science but in various areas from quantum computing to the advances in neuroscience neurotechnologies practically everything is shifting really fast and we have an obligation to make it work in every possible areas using uh, you know multidisciplinary approaches so thanks again professor ra and i hope to talk to you again in the near future and see how many of your efforts lead to fruition thank you so much i look forward to speaking with you again